Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, I am very excited to welcome you to our program tonight with Paul Steinhardt discussing his latest book, The Second Kind of Impossible, The Extraordinary Quest for a New Form of Matter. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to turn things over to David Nelson, who will be introducing the program this evening. But first, I'll just say a little bit about the series and what upcoming events we have. If you've attended our talks before, you've probably heard me say these kind of things in the past. Uh, the Harvard Science Book Talk series features talks throughout the academic year by the authors of recently published science-related literature. Coming up next month, we are delighted to welcome paleontologist and biologist Neil Shubin, the best-selling author of Your Inner Fish, for his new book, Some Assembly Required, Decoding Four Billion Years of Life from Ancient Fossils to DNA. And we'll also be hosting a motion AI pioneer, Rana El Kalubi, for her new memoir, Girl Decoded, a scientist's quest to reclaim our humanity by bringing emotional intelligence to technology. If you would like to stay up to date on this series and newly posted talks, you can find announcements about upcoming events at harvard.com slash events slash science. Also, nearly all of our events are filmed and recorded for the public, thanks to the university. You can access them at the web address that I have also written there on the board. Tonight's talk will be followed by some time for your questions, after which we're going to have a book signing and refreshments at the Cabot Science Library. And if you have not picked up a copy of the book already and you'd like one, we have some in the back of the hall and in the library for sale as well. Um, as always, a couple thank yous. Thank you to our partners here at Harvard who make this series and the cheese trays at the reception possible. And thank you to all of you for being here, for purchasing books that support independent business and for affirming that science matters. So just a quick reminder, lastly, to silence your cell phones before the talk begins. And now I'm going to turn things over to David Nelson, Harvard's Arthur K. Solomon Professor of Biophysics and Professor of Physics and Applied Physics. It's a lot of physics. His research focuses on collective effects and the physics and chemistry of condensed matter. We are very happy to have him here tonight. Please join me in welcoming David. So I'll be brief. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome my longtime friend, colleague, and collaborator, uh, Paul Steinhardt. Uh, he's the director of the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science. Um, he's the Albert Einstein Professor uh, in Science um, at Princeton, where he's on the faculty both in physics and astrophysics. Um, Paul's scientific research is remarkably diverse. Uh, I don't know of anyone who has uh, such a broad range of interests uh, spanning problems from particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, condensed matter physics, which is relevant to his talk today, and also relevant geoscience. He's also one of the original architects of the inflationary model of the universe. Um, he's also co-developed a cyclic model of the universe. Um, and um, he can also tell you about quintessence and self-interacting dark matter. Um, among his many uh, awards uh, and achievements, um, he's uh, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a winner of the Dirac Medal, uh, the Buckley Prize, uh, which is the highest honor of the uh, condensed matter physics division of the American Physical Society, and most intriguing for me, he um, recently won with the Italian geologist Luca Bindi the Aspen Prize for their discovery of the first natural quasicrystals. So I'll introduce the subject very briefly and turn it over to Paul. Uh, let me just say that uh, it's a really remarkable story that he's going to tell us, and I, I don't want to give anything away. But I will tell you that since the time of the Greeks, it's been known that there are only five regular platonic solids. There's the tetrahedron, there's the cube, there's the octahedron, and there's the dodecahedron, and finally, the icosahedron. And I'm holding an icosahedron in my hand. I'll leave this up here for Paul in case he wants to use it. Only five. And 
Many scientists have speculated about this fact, this curious fact. And in 1591, the great German astronomer in his magnum opus, uh, Mysterium Cosmographicum, Johannes Kepler proposed that the radii of the known planets could be understood in terms of a nested sequence of these five platonic solids. There were six planets and five platonic solids nested between them, so it all looked like it would work. Unfortunately, Kepler was completely wrong. And uh, an, an example where you really want to pay attention to experiment, of course, he didn't have any, uh, couldn't have known better. Um, we have more planets than six, so the five platonic solids probably have nothing to do with the planets. I, I, I'm sad to say, it's a beautiful idea. Um, uh, but since then, or at least in the centuries following Kepler, immediately following Kepler, there's almost been a mysterious conspiracy of silence about this remarkable object, at least among scientists. In fact, when, when Paul and I were uh, working together, um, uh, we noticed that in uh, the classic textbook on quantum mechanics that all physicists, almost all physicists owned by Landa and Lifshitz, uh, they dismiss the icosahedron with its remarkable five-fold symmetry axis, stating that since it's a, not a symmetry of nature, it's of no further physical interest. All that changed uh, when Paul, uh, who, by the way, I have already signed my copy of his book, um, and Dove Levine uh, came on the scene and began uh, a decades-long story, which he will now tell you about. So please join me in welcoming Paul to tell us about the second kind of impossible. Paul. Thank you, David. There you go. <laughs> well, it's really a pleasure to be back here at Harvard and a great honor to have uh, David introduce me. Uh, it brings me back to thoughts of our days working together which preceded the discovery of quasicrystals, the subject we're going to talk about tonight, but which were a key inspiration for it. Uh, scientists have a grand ambition. Our ambition is to discover something new, and to discover something genuinely new, and to discover something that is surprising. It's an inevitably going to be something that, at the time, people think is impossible. So our job as a scientist is to prove the impossible to be possible. Now, when you don't know, when, you're getting, when you don't know where the subject is heading, when you're just starting off, you're not sure whether you can succeed at all. Because there are many things that scientists believe, believe to be impossible, that truly are impossible, really are crazy, really shouldn't bother to pursue. And we try to teach that to our students. But when you're trying to find something new yourself, you go through this period of doubt. Am I working on a track which is bound to fail? It's crazy and shouldn't pursue it? Is it impossible of the first kind? Or maybe if I look closely and re-examine what everyone's been assuming all along, I'll discover some loophole, some mistake that everyone's been making up to this time, in which case it's the second kind of impossible. An impossible, which is impossible until you notice that loophole. And then there's the opportunity for a great discovery. So the subject I'm talking about tonight, and the book that is all about this struggle. And sometimes, as a, as a scientist, you struggle for days with the doubts. Sometimes it's weeks. Sometimes it's maybe even a few years. The story I'm talking about tonight is over 35 years of doubts and struggles and twists and turns. Um, more than you can possibly imagine. Good. It's certainly not your typical science story by any means, and that'll be obvious by the time we're through. Uh, at times, it looks normal, like pencil and paper or experiment, the kind of science we're accustomed to. But at one point, it's going to turn into an Indiana Jones-type adventure story. Um, it'll become a first-class detective story, a story with true international intrigue. Uh, it becomes, at another point, a father-son story. There are true villains and true heroes. There is a man of many miracles who plays a key role throughout this, uh, the latter part of the story. 
uh, there's stunning art and architecture. And uh, there's even a futuristic space odyssey. So there's a little bit of everything in this story. And there's many, many characters in the story, too many to mention. Uh, some of them are historical figures in the history of science. Some of them are famous scientists today. Some of them are people in this room, like Peter Liu sitting in row two and David Nelson sitting in row one. Uh, some of them are old, like me. Some of them are young. Some of them are human. Some of them are not. Uh, so it's a complicated story to tell. And of course, I'm not going to be able to cover all of it in this few minutes. I'm just going to try to give you an impression of different aspects of the story, how it works. And underlying it all is this notion of the impossible. That's the word that came, came up over and over again over the last 35 years in one context or another. Impossible barriers in the way that get surmounted by some luck, by some sometimes smartness, but more often dumb luck and stubbornness. So I want to begin by, first of all, explaining and giving an example of what I mean about possible versus impossible. And I'm going to do that uh, with an example that you might think at first is rather juvenile, but you'll see it actually is important for the story we're going to talk about. And for this, we're going to let's change the camera setting. So I want you to imagine the following question. You decide you're going to tile your shower floor. Uh, you're trying to decide what shape tiles to use. Uh, you, just, you think about the possibility of using a square, like in the example here. And you might ask yourself, if I buy a bunch of these squares, am I actually going to be able to tile my floor in a way that the tiles would fit together without making any holes? So, well, you take a bunch of these squares and you start to put them together uh, just to see how it goes. And it doesn't take you very long to convince yourself that, yeah, the squares will work. I can, I can tile my floor with squares without making any holes. And of course, you knew that. You could probably even picture it in your head because you've probably seen many shower floors or bathroom floors which are tiled with square tiles. So the, the result is not very surprising. But you figure, OK, that's boring also. So I'll try something more interesting. I'm going to try to do it with a, with a rectangle. Can I do that? Well, I think, again, you could certainly envisage that you could do that. OK. And again, you might have seen floors tiled that way before. So, well, OK, what about triangles? Can you do it with triangles? Well, sure, you can do it with triangles. OK, we can, we can begin to tile the floor with triangles. You've probably played with triangles before when you were a kid and understood that, that you could do that. Um, then you might try hexagons. OK. And of course, hexagons, with no surprise, you can surely do it because bumblebees can figure out how to do that. So surely you as a human can figure out how to do that. So that's not a problem. But it looks like we have lots of choices, and it's going to go on and on. Let's just see. Uh, next, we'll try what? Uh, pentagon. OK. It's kind of the next step up. And we try to put together our pentagons to make the shape. And uh-oh, uh, not so good. Not so good. Not probably a good choice for tiling your shower floor because of these holes. But you might be wondering at this point, these, these examples of these tiles were possible. You demonstrated it. And you can imagine that it could be continued forever. But in this case, I just tried putting these together as quickly as I could, and I failed. But is that because it's impossible, impossible of the first kind? Or am I just not being clever in how to put them together? Now, in this case, we know the answer. It really is impossible the first kind. That's something that was discovered by the ancient Egyptians empirically and mathematically shown rigorously about 200 years ago. And um, so, we, so we know this is really impossible of the first kind. Don't buy pentagonal tiles. <laughs> But is it, what about other shapes? What about if I tried, say, uh, a heptagon, seven-sided? What happens then? OK, so we tried a heptagon, and 
Uh, mm. This is also not a wise choice, as you can see. We're again forced to have holes. In fact, once we've gotten beyond six-fold, seven, eight, nine, 143-fold, we're cooked. We're always going to have to have holes in it. And that is something that's known to be impossible, to construct something uh, uh, which would not have holes. That's impossible of the first kind. Now we move to three dimensions. We might think about how we would fill space if we want to fill this room with boxes of a certain shape. And the first thing you might think of are cubes, simple cubes. Now, I think all of us as toddlers played with building blocks, and we know we can fit cubes together to fill a space without leaving any holes left over. But what about other shapes? What about the shape that uh, David presented, the icosahedron? That's an interesting shape. It's an interesting shape because it includes, if you look along any end of it, an axis of five-fold symmetry, and that reminds us of the pentagon that failed us in two dimensions. So what happens in three dimensions? Well, we can check. So here I've put together a bunch of icosahedra. So some of you may have met the icosahedra before in the form of Dungeons and Dragons dice. And it's nice that there's Dungeons and Dragons, that there's a company that makes those dice for those of us who love icosahedra because we can collect a bunch of them together. Now, again, just like this figure over here, they're full of these five-fold symmetry axes. So if I put them together very carefully, can I manage to put them together and fill space without making any spaces between the pieces? So, okay, let me not stop with those. I'll try this way, okay? And, well, you might have to play with them for a while, try to stuff them together as closely as you want, but whatever you do, you can kind of see I'm always going to have spaces left over. So the situation here is the same as the pentagons. No matter how I try to put them together, there's always going to be spaces left over. So you shouldn't try to use icosahedra if you want to, icosahedral boxes if you want to fill space. Now, why should you care about this problem? Why is this problem even potentially important? So here, We've put it, them, tried to put them together, and I tried to put them together really carefully. This time, I still have these spaces left over. Well, one reason why this is a really important result is because atoms like to form icosahedral clusters. If you get put together identical atoms, let's say 13 identical atoms, a common configuration, let's say for gold, particle, gold atoms, is they like to have one in the middle surrounded by 12 on the outside, producing a shape just like that icosahedron. And now you want to ask the question, if I now put together lots of gold atoms, what happens? And the problem is, even though locally they'd like to form those icosahedra, when you put together lots of the atoms together, because of those spaces, they, can't, they, they struggle against maintaining that symmetry, maintaining that arrangement. Atoms hate spaces. They want to hit, fit closely together. So they'll tear apart those icosahedra, arrange themselves into a boring pattern like cubes. So that's what happens. As far as we knew for a long time, the only forms of matter that were possible were forms of matter in which if you look along any particular direction at that matter, at that crystalline form of matter, it forms one of the allowed cases and never forms one of the disallowed cases. That was impossible, in this case impossible of the first kind, again proven um, in the 19th century to be impossible to have for if you're going to construct atoms from a single repeating unit. Impossible of the first kind, or is it? That was the question that Dove Levine and I were trying to ask back in the 1980s. And we had the notion that maybe there was a loophole around this, around this rule, this theorem, this mathematical theorem that forbid nature from ever taking advantage of the symmetry of the icosahedron. Our inspiration from this came from this tiling. It's a famous tiling. It was first constructed by Sir Roger Penrose, and it's known as a Penrose tiling. I don't have time here to tell you about all of its fascinating properties. I just want you to take a look at it and just begin to ask yourself, what is it that I'm looking at? Am I looking at a pattern which is highly ordered or looking at a pattern that's highly disordered? You might at first notice that 
that the pattern has these motifs, like this, pentag this five, um, five pointed star over here, here and here and here. And that repeats throughout the pattern. So you might think, ah, it looks like it's ordered. Then you think twice. Oh, I just saw that five-fold symmetry is forbidden in, in, for patterns, for, for space-filling patterns. So somehow that's wrong. You say, but yeah, but it really does look rather ordered. Then again, I look like, once again, I see if I try to predict what's going to happen next, depends upon what your gestalt is, you'll find that you think you see a pattern, but as you look onwards, that pattern breaks down. You can't really predict what's going to happen next. What Dove and I noticed about the pattern is that um, if you look at the rows of uh, tiles, two things are different from any kind of crystal pattern that I've shown you so far or that had been seen previously uh, by uh, physicists. The first is it doesn't consist of just a single repeating unit. There's two repeating units, a fat tile and a skinny tile. The second thing that's different about it is if you follow the pattern of fat and skinny tiles along any one direction, they don't form nice straight rows the way the squares do or the hexagons do or the triangles do. In fact, they form these kind of crinkly rows. As you go across the pattern, the crinkly rows are different. They don't crinkle the same way. So these are all kinds of novel things, loopholes in the way we used to think about the way patterns could form that allow the possibility for what appears to be a new symmetry this five-fold symmetry that was previously forbidden. If we continue to look at the patterns of these, of these crinkly rows of tiles, we find that sometimes they're, di they're separated by a long distance, sometimes by a shorter distance. In fact, they only come in those two distances. And if you follow the pattern across, the ratio of the number of longs to the number of shorts follows an irrational ratio. That is to say, the frequency of big separations, like they would, this would be an example of a big separation, versus a small separation, which is the second one, follows um, a, a pattern which is disharmonic. This is like having two tones of sound which are disharmonic. This is kind of a disharmony in space, a kind of pattern that mathematicians call quasi-periodic. So whereas patterns where you have regular repetitions like the squares are called periodic, and they lead to the notion of crystals, these are patterns which are quasi-periodic that could lead to a new notion of that we call quasi-crystals. And whereas in crystals, when rows of tiles cross one another, they cross in a nice smooth fashion, here you find when they cross, they cross in a somewhat irregular fashion, wherever they cross. So th those are all the things that are different from the way patterns have been conceived of in the past in two dimensions. And that's what gave birth to the idea that maybe that means there can be new forms of matter, because tiles can be replaced by arrangements of atoms or molecules. And this allows the possibility for arrangements of, matter, of atoms and molecules that could have now symmetries that we thought were impossible. Not just a few symmetries. Before, there were a finite number of symmetries, five in two dimensions, and a finite number in three dimensions, around 17. Now, it turns out, we didn't, and we thought that was the complete list. For over 100 years, we thought that was the complete list. It turns out we were wrong. There are additional symmetries are po that are possible, and not just a few, an infinite number. That we were literally, literally missing an infinite number of new possibilities. For example, here's a pattern with seven-fold symmetry. Here's a pattern with 11-fold symmetry. You see the complexity is getting uh, greater as we go up in symmetry. Here's a pattern with 17-fold symmetry. And one's first impression, when viewed the way I've shown them to you, is that these are beautiful, high-symmetry patterns that you could easily recognize just by staring at the clusters in the middle. But I should tell you that these quasi-crystals are and these quasi-crystal patterns are much more subtle than that. Um, I've purposely centered the pattern so you could easily read off the symmetry. But if I went to some place and outside that point of symmetry and showed you a piece of the pattern, can you guess what symmetry that is? Can you even guess whether it's ordered or I slipped in some disorder into the system? It happens to be a piece of the 17-fold. So quasi-crystals are subtle, and that's part of the reason why their existence was missed for hundreds of years. We've known about periodic patterns since ancient times, but quasi-crystals only since the 1980s. And 
we don't have to stop there. We can move up to three dimensions as well. So in three dimensions, now the situation gets more complicated because we're now working with building blocks. And the building blocks that we need if we want to construct something which is going to be quasi-periodic, uh, just like we needed two tiles before, they're going to be generally come in a variety of shapes. So for example, the case I'm going to demonstrate for you is going to be a case which involves these four different shapes shown here, okay, which, um, are going, which we can use to, if we wished, if we had enough of them, to fill this entire room without leaving any space in between. Um, they have different joinings on them, different ways they can fit together with Lego-like joinings, like that. But you might notice, I'm going to pass these around in a moment, you might notice when I pass them around that the Lego-like joinings along different faces are different. And that's because although I can use these to, I, it's, not just, it's not just that I can use these to fill this room. They have a very special mathematical property, which is the only way I can fit them together in this room is in a non-periodic way, in a non-crystalline way, with a very specific symmetry, namely, the symmetry of the icosahedron. The symmetry that we thought was impossible to build in nature is now possible if we imagine now replacing these building blocks with clusters of atoms. So let me uh, pass these guys around. And you're welcome to put them together and take them apart to get a sense of how they fit together. And you get a sense of their complexity as well as their sort of geometric beauty. Now, if you put them together, as I said, you can only put them together in fill space if you, if you um, uh, manage to keep, if you construct them in such a way that they form a pattern that keeps the five-fold symmetry. So I'll put them along here so you can see it. That keeps, that maintains the five-fold symmetry uh, in six different directions at the same time which is what the symmetry of the icosahedron is. And as you build the structure, you can, first of all, build one layer, and then another layer, and then another layer. And you could fill space, this entire room, if you had enough pieces. Uh, and furthermore, that's the only way you could fill space. And that's important for our story, because it means if you imagine this as these, these units as representing atoms or groups of atoms, then these Lego-like rules would be like forces between the atoms that force them to make this structure, that only allow them to make this structure. And that gives, that's what gave us the idea that this isn't just a geometrical idea. It may be something which there, for which, there may be cases in which there are atoms or groups of atoms that actually want to form this structure because the, energet, the, the forces which bind them together are similar to the forces that are represented in that, um, by those Lego-like joinings. So then we computed what the... Uh, we computed what would be the pattern you would get if you were to show, shine a beam of x-rays or electrons through a material which had that property. And what we showed is that the pattern would be patterns of sharp spots, a kind of snowflake pattern with points between points between points, like shown there, and reflecting the symmetry of the, uh, it's full of pentagons as you study the pattern. And just as we were getting to this point in our results, uh, Someone came to visit me and Dove, that was David, bringing a paper, a very interesting paper, by a group working a few hundred miles to the south of us, led by Dan Schachtman, Elon Blech, Denis Gradius, and John Kahn, in which they had, knowing nothing about our work, accidentally made a material which, when they shone electrons through it, produced a pattern that was virtually the same as the one on the left. And we didn't know anything about them. They didn't know anything about us. These were two parallel developments that happened to coincide at the same time, and, who's dis and which were mutually discovered, thanks to David's bringing the paper to me, at a particular instant that we can all remember. That was the beginning of the story of quasicrystals, when it first became apparent that quasicrystals are possible. So over the next few years, 
many examples of quasicrystals became, began to be discovered using different combinations of elements and using different techniques for synthesizing these materials in the laboratory. But there was a question that was bothering me from the beginning. Once we knew we could make them in the laboratory, why is it that they were never found in nature? In nature, we find crystals. We don't just synthesize them in the, la in the, synthesize them in the laboratory. We also can make them in nature. Uh, why hadn't we seen quasicrystals? Or maybe there were quasicrystals, and we just hadn't noticed them, because until this moment, no one had the idea that they might exist. Maybe we've been walking across them every single day and just simply hadn't noticed them. Um, or maybe it's impossible. Maybe there's some reason why it can't be made in nature, because in the laboratory, we can put together groups of atoms of different types under highly controlled conditions. Maybe there's something about quasicrystals that demand, demand that. And that was an idea that some people had been proposing at the time. But because of the model that I passed around, because it suggests that in principle, there should exist the possibility of groups of kinds of atoms or groups of atoms or uh, combinations of atoms and molecules that would be forced to make this structure, it seemed logical or possible that they maybe should exist in nature. We just have to look for them. The first attempts to look for them didn't come out all that well. Um, uh, but beginning in the, uh, 1999, working with uh, Peter Liu and others at Princeton, uh, we, uh, a systematic search began, uh, which proceeded for a few years using a number of techniques I, hadn't, I don't have time to describe here tonight. But the bottom line is they led to failure. Uh, and the failure continued for year after year after year until 2007 when we were contacted by this fellow, a fellow I'd never heard, before, heard of before, Luca Bindi, who was a mineralogist working in Florence at a, a, small, a small museum at the university there. And he offered to come, to work, come and work with us uh, and to explore whatever we wanted to explore in his museum. And we didn't realize it at the time. I didn't realize it at the time. But this is one of the great strokes of luck in this entire investigation, which had now had been going on for decades. Uh, not just because what Luca turned out to have in his museum, but because of Luca himself, who immediately became as fanatic about this subject as I was, and was willing to go to any means. And he became what, what, I, what I called our man of many miracles. He was the miracle maker many times when the subject uh, got stuck where we got trapped, where we had some barrier that seemed impossible to overcome, he more, most often was the person who found some way around it by some miraculous means or another. But when we started, it didn't start very well. For the first year and a half, I, we started looking through different uh, minerals in this museum that seemed to match up with some of the ideas that we had that might be likely candidates. There was failure, 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 failure. We were all ready to write a paper about all the new failures when he said, but there's uh, in my basement of my museum here, there's these drawers, this collection of these little boxes, each of which has a little piece of little mineral inside it. And um, one of these minerals in this box, in this set of drawers, which is number some 2,000 or so, is this one. I've blown it up here. Uh, it's called katirkite. It's a, supposed to be a crystal mixture of copper and aluminum. So it's not a quasi-crystal. It's supposed to be a crystal. It's, it's, the darker, it's supposed to be the darker material here. However, I know that aluminum and copper are elements that, are, that have been seen in the laboratory as some of the elements that are included in some quasi-crystals. So maybe that's a good reason to check out this particular candidate. After all, this is not a nugget of one substance. It's a rock which contains a conglomeration of different minerals, and maybe one of them turns out to be a quasi-crystal. Maybe most of it's this crystal of aluminum and copper, but maybe something is, some, is, is, is something else. So, so he sliced and diced the material, sent some tiny little grains of it to Princeton, and on New Year's 2009, at about 5 in the morning, I gathered there <coughs> with our... Um, electron microscopist, Nan Yao. We put some of those grains on the electron microscope, and within a matter of instants, up popped up a beautiful pattern of spots, 
just like the one I had shown in the previous slides, just like the one that Schechtman had seen, but much better, much finer, truly point spots, truly perfect, much more perfect or as perfect as anything I had ever seen made in the laboratory. <coughs> so that should have been the end of the story. We should have declared victory. We won. We found the natural quasi-crystal. It's in there inside that rock. But it wasn't, not by a long shot, because curiosity took, us, uh, curiosity t uh, took the better of us. In particular, I was interested in the question of, <clears throat> how is it that nature managed to make this very perfect quasi-crystal in this very messy rock situation when in the laboratory we need to only form these quasi-crystals under very controlled conditions? What does nature know that we don't? Or what, <clears throat> what does this tell us some, about something about nature? So that led me to talk to geologists, both at Princeton, at the Smithsonian in Washington, and elsewhere, to try to answer that question. And their response was universally the same. They would say, OK, thanks for telling us this story. I can now tell you, given the information that you've provided, that what you've got there is impossible. Um, not impossible because it's a quasi-crystal, but because of the chemistry of the quasi-crystal that you claim to have discovered. You're claiming to have discovered a quasi-crystal composed of aluminum, copper, and in this case, some iron. Now, iron is plentiful in nature. Metallic aluminum, alloy of aluminum, doesn't exist in nature. It's impossible. Uh, aluminum is plentiful on the earth. There's lots of it. But aluminum has an, a, a tremendous affinity for oxygen. So whenever you find uh, aluminum, it's always going to be attacked to, attached to oxygen. And you're telling me that isn't what you found. The only way we can make aluminum separate from oxygen is in an aluminum foundry. And in which case, what you've probably got there is, well, a four-letter word, uh, a piece of slag a piece of industrial byproducts. So maybe it was made someplace in downtown Berlin or near some aluminum foundry someplace. Uh, but it's certainly not something natural. And they sent us away, imagining that they would never hear from us again. What they underestimated was the stupid stubbornness of Luca and me, because we weren't about to give up, uh, just based on that claim. Uh, the argument seemed uh, that it was impossible seemed to be of the second kind, something that wasn't certainly, that was based on common assumptions about the way aluminum f forms, but not absolutely proven in the way that you would prove one plus one equals two or something like that. So that led us to, to explore further, see what we could learn about the sample. Where had it come from? And this is when the adventure really got wild. So the first thing we had to encounter was uh, looking for a missing Dutchman. Why a missing Dutchman? Because it turns out in the records of the museum in Florence, it explained that this sample had been purchased from a Dutchman. All those samples in, the, in, the, um, in those drawers, in fact, had been purchased from a Dutchman back in now 1990. Searching for the missing Dutchman ended up in failure. Uh, we never were able to find him. Um, the um, failure to find the missing Dutchman um, um, led us to look at other records where he, where, he, uh, where he might have lived and where he might have come from. And we eventually found that he had passed away a number of years ago. So that was the end of that line of inquiry. But it turned out that even though we couldn't find him, we could find his widow. And when we found the widow, well, she knew nothing about his rock collection or what he had given up, but after being uh, interrogated for about an hour, she finally relented and said, even though she knew nothing about her husband's rock collection or anything about it, she did have in her house, in a drawer, a secret diary. <laughs> a secret diary that her husband used to keep about his discoveries. Um, and she brought the diary out to Luca, who had come to visit her in person. And he turned, and sure enough, he found the description of, his husband, of, the, of her husband having gone to Romania in about 1987 and having obtained a number of minerals there, 
which was strictly illegal in the middle of Soviet times. So it was kind of obscure in how it was described. And it further described he had obtained this, he obtained this mineral from a Romanian by the name of Tim. <laughs> Tim the Romanian. So, OK, now we're on the search for Tim the Romanian. And this is the day of the internet where you can go and search throughout Romania and ask people in Romanian using Google Translate, you know, do you know anything about Tim, a Romanian who would have been a smuggler back in uh, Soviet times? And curiously enough, no one answered the call. Um, so that led us back to the last source we had at the time, which was the widow. Did she know? Lu sent Luca back to, uh, to Amsterdam, where the widow lived, and asked, did she know anything about Tim the Romanian? Had she ever heard her husband mention this strange person? And her answer was no. She really knew nothing about her husband's collection. She had given us the secret diary. That's everything she knew. She knew there's nothing, nothing, nothing. Another hour of inquiry and questioning and asking the question from every angle until finally she relents and says, but my husband used to keep a secret, secret diary. <laughs> Where he used to keep the purchases that were you know, questionably legal. And there, in the secret, secret diary, there really was a discussion about how he had gone to Romania, uh, had gone to Romania, met Tim, and Tim, now it described where Tim had gotten his material from. He had got it from a certain mineralogist who lived in Russia. A Russian mineralogist who was also an apparatchik at the time, that is to say, he was, a so he was high up in the Soviet party, in the Soviet hi hierarchy. He had, his family had connections to the KGB. He was head of the Institute of Platinum in Soviet times. Platinum's a valuable mineral, but it's also a valuable defense mineral. So he was clearly very connected. And we have to, now we had to spend our next period of time trying to track down what this guy was. Was he still alive? He was still alive. He was no longer in Russia, though. He had emigrated to Israel. So now we're caught trying to find this fellow in Israel, and we eventually find him. And when we finally encounter him and ask him uh, whether or not he was the person who actually had found this mineral that had made its way to Tim and on its way to the Dutchman, on its way to Florence, his answer was yes. And we asked him if he had more material, and he said, maybe. But what we didn't realize at the time, it took us a little while to realize it, is that this fellow was a liar and a scoundrel. <laughs> and so although he was trying to get some money from us in order to try to provide some more material and more information, in fact, he had none of that information. It became clear as we asked him questions. He nearly knew nothing about uh, this material at all. Uh, but that didn't stop him from, as a scoundrel, uh, making it difficult for us. Because as we began to inquire of more, more people who knew about him and where he might have found the material, uh, he would use his historic connections with the KGB and threaten to use those connections to threaten our, the, our contacts there, literally death threats for a period. So this also was part of the adventure and part of the struggle to try to get more information. But then finally, after a lot of these struggles and lots of wrong turns, we actually managed to get find the person who personally, back in 1979, went to an obscure e region of far eastern Russia, dug there, panning for platinum, working for a Russian scoundrel, had found some shiny metal that he knew was not platinum, and brought it back to the Russian just to show him that even though he had failed to find find platinum, he at least had done some work. He had at least done something. He was afraid that if he'd come back empty-handed, he might be uh, in contact with the KGB friends of, of our Russian scoundrel. Um, and that's the last he had heard of those shiny pieces of metal. He didn't know that the Russian had brought them back to Moscow and then to St. Petersburg, found some new crystalline elements, crystalline minerals in there made of aluminum and copper, smuggled some of the material out to what eventually made its way to Florence, published his results without including him as a co-author. He knew nothing about that. But he, by this time, news that we had found a quasi-crystal in some Russian rock was known to him. So he was really eager to help us. 
and immediately began helping us in all kinds of ways, beginning with pointing out a map exactly where our sample came from, from a stream there in the middle, literally of nowhere, in the Koryak Mountains of Chukotka, which is the Okug, or province, which is most north and most east in Russia, right across the Bering Strait from Alaska, just north of the Kamchatka Peninsula that juts out into the Pacific and the Sea of Okutsk there and right where that pin is. And there's no aluminum foundry there. There aren't even people there. It's, uh, it's a desolate place. And so now we had a pretty good story, a pretty good argument that what we had there was something that truly was natural. It, didn't, it wasn't a piece of slag. There was no slag to be found in, in an area like that. However, should you believe this long story I've just to told you, this long tale I've just told you, we asked ourselves that question, and should that be convincing enough to convince us that our sample was truly natural? If you really wanted to know that it was natural, and if you really wanted to prove the case, you needed to, more, you needed to test the material itself. But unfortunately, by this time, we had used up all the little material we had. So the only way you're going to get more material to test and to really confirm what it was would be, say, to go back to where it was found in the first place, this obscure area of far eastern Russia. And that is impossible. I mean, Chukotka is a desolate area. It's a controlled area. Uh, you can't, even Russians can't travel there freely um, for various reasons, for both a combination of military and, and economic reasons. Um, you would need permission from the Russian government, you would need the Russian military, you would need the FSB, the modern KGB, you'd need the local Chukotka government, you'd need to find transportation, you'd need to find money, you'd need to find people willing to go, who know the territory to go along. I mean, come on, that's impossible. That said, on July 22nd, 2011, at the beginning of Chukotka summer, okay, the first day of summer when the ground was now soft enough that you could actually dig into it, so it made sense to try, here we see five Americans, one Italian, seven Russians, and uh, a cat <laughs> named Bucks, ready to take off on this ridiculous adventure in search of what is likely a wild goose chase since all we had was a few grains back from 1979 to go on, what were the chances we could go back and even find anything at all by uh, you know, 40 years later? Now, I should say, this, this group uh, that uh, was put together, I, it was my job to put it together, it was my, uh, uh, um, my notion to put it together, consisted of people with a wide range of experiences, all of whom had experience doing geological work in various extreme settings, some right there near Chukotka, some in similar areas like um, in Alaska and British Columbia, some, one of whom had worked uh, in Grizzly Bear Park, knew a lot about bears, and we needed a bear expert because we were going to encounter bears. Um, everyone had some uh, significant outdoor experience, except for one person in this group. OK, I'll have to figure out who that is. Oh, it's this guy over here. This guy is a theoretical physicist who works with pencil and paper and blackboards and literally had never done any outdoor, outdoor overnight activity ever, not even in the backyard, you know, having a tent in the backyard. And it was the last person you'd ever want to have to go on such an expedition. It was totally an experience. Now, fortunately for him, on this, in this group, there was another character, namely this guy over here in the red coat, whom he had known literally since he was a baby, because that's my son, Will, who was a geoscientist then at Caltech on his way to Harvard, where he just recently completed his PhD. And he became my tent partner and my teacher and my guide. And every time you know, I needed advice on various things having to do with the expedition, he, he was that person. So he, uh, and this was, and this was our team. And just to give you an idea of what the trek was like, um, let me uh, show you how it was like to travel across the tundra. So from the distance, the tundra looks beautifully flat and peaceful. In fact, when you're passing over it, it's like a roller coaster ride. And even the ground is a roller coaster ride because of the way the 
uh, permafrost melts and uh, freezes over and over again. And then, then also you have to constantly cross, cross these streams many times a day. And this is what it's like to cross one of those streams. And you do this about five or six times a day, or 10 times a day, depending on which part of the trip you're taking. Uh, most of the time, you're following a kind of trail, or it looks like a trail. But sometimes, the drivers will be driving right into a forest, like, like Victor, our driver, was doing here. And I looked at Victor, and I said, where's the trail, Victor? And he gave me a funny look, like, trail? Who needs a trail? Now, that's not to say there weren't legitimately scary moments. There was a moment when one of our trucks almost caught fire, and then there was this crossing of the Katirka River. This is permafrost territory. You don't know how a deeper river is. And we're both going to have, both trucks are going to have to cross. And in principle, we were told the trucks were supposed to be able to float, but no one had ever tested the, the, these trucks before. And one was old, and one was new, and, well, and then, even if you make it on the way going, you have to remind yourself at that point you have, eventually have to make it back. There were creatures small and great. Uh, billions and billions and billions and billions of mosquitoes that we had to contend with. And also Kamchatka brown bears. Kamchatka brown bears are famously vicious. They're like grizzly bears. They're incredibly fast. They could run faster than our truck. Our, Coach, our, one of, as I said, one of our team was an expert at working at Grizzly Bear Park, um, Chris Andronicus, um, as well as being a geologist, structural geologist. And he gave us lessons at the beginning about what you should do if you encounter a bear at close range, different things you could do. At the end of which he said, actually, it doesn't make a difference what you do. You're dead. So, <laughs> So that was not encouraging. And there were bears near us where we wake up in the morning, there would be bear, these huge bear prints that we would see there. So, but fortunately, we had no really close encounters with them. Here was the last day, August 3rd. I showed you the first day of summer. We're now on the middle of fall in Chukotka land on August 3rd. And two days later, when we left the Koryak Mountains and turned around and looked back at where we came from, we saw it had been covered with snow. Winter had come to Chukotka. So we had come on the first day of summer and just managed to escape. So beautiful timing, brilliantly timing by luck. Um, now, I should also tell you that in the field, you cannot tell what you are digging, what you are collecting. You can't tell by looking at a rock or, just, or looking at a grain, whether it's a quasi-crystal or not. It doesn't come out beautifully faceted the way you might form it in the laboratory. It's been out there in nature for a long time. So all you can do is collect as many, much material as you can, panning it as much as you'd like to pan for gold, so you can at least capture the higher density material that is the material that most likely would be quasi-crystalline, but so are lots of other things. Gather as much as you can, bags and bags and bags of it, about a ton and a half dug and uh, uh, about many pounds of material that you bring back, and bring it back and then begin to look through it grain by grain. Millions of grains, grain by grain. So it takes weeks before you begin to make much headway in the search. It took about six weeks before we got a first result, a first reading from Luca, who was doing this grain by grain study. He presented this particular grain. It was one of the grains he had noticed in the field that he thought might be promising. And it turned out that it really is. Uh, the darkish material there is characteristic of what uh, the material we had seen in Florence. And in fact, is characteristic, uh, both of them were characteristic of a certain kind of meteorite. And when he viewed the sample, he noticed it had some of these shiny material on it. And when he extracted that shiny material and, sh and, and shown um, uh, electrons through it, or I'm sorry, x-rays through it, he found, sure enough, a beautiful pattern. Beautiful tenfold pattern, just like you would expect to have for a quasi-crystal. In fact, it had the exact same chemistry as the quasi-crystal that we had discovered in the sample in Florence. So it was at that moment, really at that moment for the first time, that we were really sure 
that quasicrystals really existed in nature, we had picked this sample out of the ground ourselves, and that that crazy detective story that we had worked out was really true. It wasn't just some, we had made some mistake along the way. So that was really a key moment in the whole story uh, when impossible seemed to really be possible. And that's really just the beginning. We discovered in going through these millions of grains, now nine different grains, each of which tell us about different parts of the story about how this sample formed, um, including a slew of never before seen crystal mi minerals, not just quasi crystals. So by this time, we found three different types of quasi crystals, plus lots and lots of uh, a number of new crystal minerals, one of which is this one over here. It's a personal favorite. Um, the team, behind my back, put together a proposal to name this mineral Steinhardite. So um, I'm very proud of this, uh, this mineral because it means I have been mineralized <laughs> permanently as a result of this work. Um, uh, even though it's not a quasi-crystal, it's a crystal. Uh, its discovery led us to discover, to discover a new type of crystal besides the original. Um, and we also confirmed something that seemed to be it first arose when we began looking at the Florence sample. Um, as we began to study the Florence sample, and then the later samples we recovered in Chukotka, we confirmed that our sample was not made on Earth. It was natural, but it was not made on Earth. It was made in space. It was a piece of a meteorite. And not just any old meteorite, but a special brand of meteorite, which meteorite experts call CV3 carbonaceous chondrites. And what's important about CV3 carbonaceous chondrites, what makes them the most popular meteorites to study among meteorite experts, is they are the oldest meteorites to have formed in the solar system. They formed before the planets formed. They are the primal material from which planets were eventually created. And so if you want to learn something about the origin of the solar system, you want to know something about these chondrites. And what we've discovered now is something that no one had ever seen before, that among the minerals you can find in carbonaceous chondrites in this primal material are quasicrystals. And these quasicrystals really do have this peculiar chemistry that geologists and meteorite experts had at first told us were impossible. Now we know they are possible. They are actually part of the fabric of the initial material that makes up our solar system. Perhaps playing some, and perhaps the processes that created them that we still don't understand are actually important processes that will give us new clues about how the planets formed. That is not the end of the story, not by a long shot. That's, in fact, a long shot being taken over there. That's Paul Asimov at Caltech about to fire off a cannon in which one of the things we could do is we could do experiments that would actually fire together material that would collide in much the way the meteorites might have collided and see if we could make a quasi-crystal that way. And sure enough, we did. The, thing on the images on the right are images of an asteroid, an asteroid in the asteroid belt that using information gained from our experience with these cannon experiments and also measurements of the isotopic ratios, um, ratios of isotopes in our quasi-crystal in our, in our quasi sample and other reflectivity information and the like. This is a candidate for, might be the parent asteroid which, um, gave, from which our quasi-crystal originally came. So that we can imagine someday not looking in Kumchukotka, but going into space and maybe visiting an asteroid like this and discovering the quasi-crystals there. And that might sound impossible, but there are people, including people here at Harvard, that are very interested in the possibility of asteroid mining and visiting asteroids. And some of that, you may know, has already taken place. So although it might sound impossible, it's probably impossible of the second kind. And maybe someday, will find quasi-crystals at their point of natural origin, and that'll be the key to figuring out the, story, the full story of them. But I'll stop there. If you want to learn more about this, please, uh, uh, please read the book, and feel free to always send me questions when they arise. Thank you.
We're going to do about 10 minutes of questions. If anyone has one, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. So, <clears throat> as you know, uh, diamond is a metastable form of uh, carbon. And if you heat diamond up to 1200 C, it turns into graphite. Uh, are quasi-crystals metastable forms of matter? Yeah, that's, um, so we don't have a, we don't have a, um, we, we, we don't know in general. We know for specific cases, the ones that we, the ones we know that they are, that they are metastable, with the exception of a few for which we're not sure of yet at the present time. We, we haven't, they haven't been studied enough to be sure whether or not they're stable or metastable. In principle, from what I showed you with those building blocks, there's no reason why they can't be stable forms of matter, truly stable forms of matter at ordinary, at ordinary pressures. I think that's what you mean, at, at terrestrial pressures. Uh, but we don't know the answer to that question. What we do know is that once they form, they can last billions of years. That is something that we know. Diamond is also forever. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, over here, um, thank you for the excellent talk. I want to ask, is a quasi-crystal good for anything? As, as in, in a sense, as a technological material, not as a basic science sort of advance. Not like as motivating trips to Chukotka or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they, I mean, we are first beginning to discover we are in the process of this. The community is in the process of learning more about quasi-crystals as the years go on and what they might be useful for. Their first use, I'll give you a, I want to, oh, it's not in the sense. Their first use um, that people noticed is that quasi-crystals are harder than crystals made of similar elements. So if you want to make an aluminum alloy, a certain combination of elements, if you can make a quasi-crystal of those elements, they're more difficult, they're, they're resistant to deformation and more rigid, more brittle, or more rigid than uh, um, crystals made of, the, of similar elements. In fact, even before we knew about quasi-crystals, they were, they were being used in, in, the, uh, in, in the sheath, in the hulls of air, aircraft, aluminum, the aluminum sheath, of, uh, aluminum hulls of aircraft without um, people knowing about it. It was discovered later, after, after, after they've been used for a while, a certain aluminum alloys were used for a while, that they contain within them grains of quasi-crystal in there. So it had been sort of empirically discovered that they're useful as hard forms of, um, uh, as, as harder forms of, let's say, aluminum alloys. There, some of them are also slipperier than Teflon, or, or, or sli slippery like Teflon, I should say. Not quite as slippery, but slippery as Teflon. So they have been used for cookware, for example, as surface, you can, uh, I think the company has stopped manufacturing them, but you can buy them on e an eBay. You can buy cookware, which has a quasi-crystal coating, um, which, um, which is hard, but unlike Teflon, which scratches easily, it doesn't scratch easily. So it's a, uh, so it has that advantage. It's been used, therefore, for, for a number of industrial parts, hypodermic needles, and things like that. Now, uh, and then more recently, some of us have been interested in, their, um, uh, in, their, in the propagation of electrons and phonons through quasi-crystals, and, and the propagation of light through quasi-crystal quasi -crystal, um, 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 lattices of different uh, of, uh, diff of combinations of materials with different dielectric properties. Uh, and so one of the applications that some of us have been looking at is, is what we call photonic quasi-crystals, quasi-crystals uh, that could be used to control the flow of light through them in much the way that a semiconductor controls the flow of electrons through it. And that could be used for photonic circuits in much the way that silicon can be used for, is used for electronic circuits. I still think the subject is at its infancy. Um, a lot of the mathematical tools and physics, the theoretical physics ideas we use for crystals can't be directly applied to quasi-crystals. We need, we need improvements on those ideas, and it's still early days. Um, uh, yeah. uh, since you're studying um, these uh, quasi-crystals on, on uh, meteorites, especially carbonaceous meteorites. 
Now, there's a mysterious process that goes into making a carbonaceous meteorite, and that's the formation of chondrules. Are these um, quasi-crystals associated with that chondral formation? That's a good question. So I don't have the image here, but one of our, uh, so a chondral is like a knot. It looks like a knot in the, in, in the carbonaceous chondrate, which is surrounded usually by sort of broken brescia or something like that. And we have a beautiful, one of our samples is a beautiful example with quasi-crystal grains right in the middle of the chondral, surrounded by brescia. Yeah. So it's a good question. Yeah. Any last questions? Uh, Professor, thank you for that beautiful talk. I was wondering whether I should ask this question. It's kind of personal. Uh, in this day of um, uh, distraction, I'm interested in the role of concentration, focus in learning. So you are obviously a very focused person. Uh, I was interested in in knowing your experiences, you know, do you ever have problems concentrating? Or do you have strategies for work, for your research, and for pe your colleagues you've seen around you? Could you give us some insight into the role of concentration and focus in study, research, learning? Hmm. Well, I think um, I'm not sure I have anything special to say. I think that um, scientists are driven and, uh, by questions. And um, it keeps us up at night, and it keeps us you know, going during the day. Uh, it's not so much um, that we're having to struggle to focus. It's that we are driven to try to find the answer to the question. And I always explain to my students, I'll walk through a wall if I have to in order to get that question answered. Do whatever it takes. And you can see, uh, I've, you've only got a brief sampling here of all the things we had to go through in order to, 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 um, to have success here. Uh, and I think it's just some, you know, it's something that there's a, uh, people just, they, um, their curiosity and their love of satisfying their curiosity just keeps them what you would call focused or driven. That's the best I can offer. All right, and we have time for one last one right here. Hi, um, I remember reading that the scientific community, especially Powling famously, did not accept quasi-crystals so smoothly. It wasn't covered in the talk, it was just like your perspective on that. Yeah, so that's the way science usually proceeds. A new, something as new is discovered, and it takes a number of years before things get settled. And yes, Linus Pauling um, um, was, a strong, was one of the strong skeptics of the quasi-crystal theory. He had his own idea how it was really a crystal, could be a crystal in disguise, what we call a multiply twinned crystal, a crystal that would occur in different crystallites which form together, look accidentally, remind you of something with five-fold symmetry, even though the microscopic arrangement of atoms was not that. And there were other competing ideas. Schechtman himself, the experimentalist, he and his colleague had their own different theory of what the structure might be. And one of the problems with Schechtman's original sample was you could not tell from his sample which of these theories was correct. It really was not a high quality sample. It was a sample that happened to be made uh, through a sort of rapid cooling process. And if you tried to cool it more slowly to make it more perfectly, it would crystallize instead. So it was definitely something that was metastable rather than stable. Um, and so for a number of years, this controversy raged. All these theories were sort of equally good, and each of them advanced in various ways, until finally, around 1987, 88, a Japanese group discovered a different quasi-crystal, something entirely different than what Schechtman had found. And this sample, this sample produced nearly perfect patterns that could only be explained by the quasi-crystal picture. Pauling didn't exactly give up at that point, but we actually communicated quite a bit over the years. At least privately, I think he understood that the quasi-crystal picture was vastly superior to his, very, what had now become a very complicated model. Um, and it settled the issue. Now, that's not the end of the story. That particular combination, that particular material that was made in Japan, that very first, what I would call, bona fide quasi-crystal, contained a particular combination of aluminum, copper, and iron. 
And it's exactly the same combination of aluminum, copper, and iron that was in that meteorite. So it reappeared. And when we discovered in the meteorite, I had on my desk a sample of the synthetic material. We could actually compare the two. We can see what the difference is where we couldn't detect the difference between their composition. So that was a way of proving that we really had what we thought we had, a quasi-crystal. But it's kind of you know, a curious thing, the way the story played out. All right, that's all the time we have. One more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your patience. Thank you.